Um, just like magic. Um, welcome, Martha. Welcome, Joanne. Welcome, Victoria. I can see more people coming through. Um, so the title of this event is A Hopeful Vote, um, Fresh Ideas for Democratic Renewal. Um, and I don't know whether people are feeling hugely depressed in the UK about democracy today or actually hopeful that there might be some change now that things are becoming a bit less stuck. Um, so I couldn't think of a better time to be having a conversation about democratic renewal. So thank you everyone for joining us for this. Um, we wanted to do an event that explores the potential for democratic renewal, what it could look like, how it could be achieved. And this is the first in many events like this we want to hold to, to explore these ideas. I'm new to Demos. My name's Polly Curtis and I'm the interim CEO um, with Demos this year to take this agenda forward. Um, and um, I don't know whether what happened today really changes the nature of this conversation or not. We could have been having this conversation two years ago, a year ago, but actually it feels more and more urgent every day. So I'm going to start by introducing our two fantastic speakers. But just to say, we've got so many people with really excellent insights in the audience. I want to um, be bringing people into the conversation as much as possible throughout. Um, so our two speakers today, we first have Martial Bou, who is the former chief executive of the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, responsible for regulating MPs' pay and expenses. Um, and Martial is also a trustee of Demos, we're very um, lucky to have him, and author of a new book called The Rules of Democracy, which feels very relevant today. So welcome, Martial. Um, our second speaker is Bjorn Levy Gunnarsson, um, who is an Icelandic MP for the Pirate Party, who is really changing the way politics works. And we wanted to make sure that we were looking outside our own system for inspiration in this conversation. So I'm just gonna start by asking Martial, can you introduce yourself, your background and how you came to be writing this book at such a timely moment um, on the rules of democracy? Thanks, Polly, and uh, thank you everybody for turning up. Yes, I, um, I spent six and a half years regulating MPs, their pay, their expenses, their pensions, their staff, their officers, um, and making sure that they had enough money to do their jobs, but not the money that they didn't need to have. And that, and some, and that some MPs claim through the expenses scandal that we had here a decade or so ago. Um, I've also uh, been a director of the National Audit Office and the Audit Commission. Um, I've worked in Downing Street and in government departments. Um, and I now also, as well as having the privilege of being on the board of Demos, I chair the UK's Institute of Regulation. So. Um, in, in the various roles that I've had, I have spent a lot of time enforcing rules. Um, and, and that was in part why I uh, decided to write a book about the rules of democracy, because uh, democracy, in my view, needs to be regulated just as much as um, healthcare workers or businesses or um, airline pilots also need to be regulated. Um, and it's not regulated very well at the moment for all kinds of reasons, which I'm very happy to talk about. Uh, but I have uh, just published this book uh, on the rules of democracy, and I um, propose not only um, say not only about the importance of democracy, which we're going to talk about, I'm sure, but also how we can improve democracy because it does need to be improved. And um, Marcia, what's your analysis of what the problem is with democracy? I mean, we know there are multiple ways you could describe it but what's your kind of central what are you trying to fix well um um basically the last 30 years have uh, changed so much you know there's a, it, it's about globalization and the tech revolution at heart and uh, and these two phenomena i mean we all of us we know multiple ways in which our lives have been completely revolutionized you know now here talking to this little screen uh you know down the road from uh, from some of you but across the ocean from others um you know this is this has completely changed the way that we interact with each other and the way that we think about our society and uh, we need to update democracy too because 
uh, if we reflect back, and this is what I do in the book, on the Industrial Revolution that took place in this country uh, about 200 years ago, that profoundly changed the, 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 the country that we live in, our communities, the way we work, the way we interact with each other, yeah. and um, democracy had to change. We did have democracy before the Industrial Revolution, but it goodness me, it had to change. And it led to uh, reform acts in the 19th century. Um, it led to uh, the expansion of the franchise, first of all, to working men and then to women. It led to the creation of fairer constituencies, no pocket boroughs. It led to the creation of rules, basically, so that elections could be fought more fairly and we could be better represented, represented uh, at the decision-making table. All of those changes were really hard fought. They were not easy. Uh, as, as, as we all know, um, but they were the result, they had to happen as a result of the Industrial Revolution. We've gone through a parallel revolution in the last 30 years, and we need to update democracy similarly to reflect those changes, that we have a global world now that we did not have in the same way before. We have higher expectations now of services and we, we, we there are better ways of, of doing that. We deserve to understand than more about how our taxes are raised and spent. It's all possible now te technologically. So, you know, in many, many ways, which I, I go through and I'm happy to explain here, um, we need to update democracy in the same way that our, our forebears did 200 years ago to reflect the changes of the Industrial Revolution. It's going to be tough, but it's got to happen. So what would your update look like? What are the kind of key changes you, you, you prescribe for for the rules of democracy? Well, very briefly, six, six major changes. The first one is that we need to have a global democratic mechanism in addition to local and, and national democracy because we live in a global world. Uh, tech needs, needs to be regulated, the environment. Um, we need to have uh, transparent, accountable decision makers uh, thinking about trade, finance, the, um, the internet, cryptocurrencies. None of this happens at the moment. So we need to have a global democratic uh, mechanism. That's the first one. The second one, as I say, we need to have, uh, we, we have the potential to know much more about how our money is taken from us and spent on our behalf. So, you know, the second thing is that we need to have much clearer, um, more transparent uh, understanding of, of, of our tax accounts, basically. The third one is that politicians, and this is obviously very relevant for today, mm. but politicians need to be held to account better too for what they say and what they do. It's too easy on social media. And we've got examples from all countries in the world, actually, of how po politicians are unmediated in the way that they talk to the electorate and uh, they can get away with, with things with no consequences because uh, there are long gaps between elections. We need to strengthen select committees. We need to hold po politicians better to account. Uh, next, we need to improve the public services. Obviously, that's what it's all about at the end of the day, and there are ways in which we can do that um, by encouraging them to learn from each other. Um, also, we need to um, take responsibility ourselves, in my view, because um, we, we've been led to believe over the last couple of decades, in a way, that public services are the same as the services that we can just use our phone to uh, access, but public services are not um, delivered to us like a book or a pizza. We have to participate in our communities and uh, that means not only uh, obeying the law and paying our taxes but also voting and being an active contributor to communities. That's again not a straightforward thing. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I'm a regulator. I believe that there need to be uh, mechanisms to, to uh, that are fair to uh, impose rules on uh, democratic actors um, so that they can do their job on our behalf, but also that we have confidence that they're not cheating or lying or pulling the wool over our eyes. And, uh, and that's obviously through the courts, but there are other ways uh, like um, in this country, the Parliamentary Commission for Standards, the Electoral Commission, Boundary Commission, these are all organizations that are a little bit boring uh, regulation is, nobody really likes referees, but they, they are there to make sure that people play fairly by the rules, and, and that's what we need to have as well. Um, well, that's a plan. We're all signed up. Let's go for it. Um, I think there's lots of people in the conversation here who, who have some really interesting contributions. So I'm, I'm looking at um, Ellen Judson, who's here, um, head of CASM at Demos, who can talk to 
the digital um, challenge we're facing. And I also would like to later come back to Will Moy, who's in the audience, who's head of Full Fact, the most fantastic organization holding politicians to account. And I think they've got a really interesting campaign on holding politicians to account for what they say. I'd love to come to Will a bit later as well. But Marcy, I thank you for that. Um, I um, that that's a kind of like a, a manifesto for changing the rules of politics. Um, I'd love to come to Bjorn now because Bjorn has really been involved in changing the culture of politics through the system in Iceland. So um, Bjorn, do you want to introduce yourself and um, and tell us tell us what you've been doing in Iceland and maybe just for new beginners, kind of a couple of words on what the Pirate Party your party is. Right. Uh, so my name is Bjorn Gunnarsson. I member of parliament for the Pirate Party here in Iceland, have been since 2016, uh, deputy member since 2013. And uh, I come from a computer science background, not a political background. I've never been affiliated with like uh, youth organizations in the established parties and all that. So I, I come from a more like technical uh, background of, of, of doing things. and. Uh, the Pirate Party as, as such uh, originates in Sweden in 2006 and this is during the like height, height of the copyright issue crisis where every, everyone was downloading uh, things illegally and like the knee-jerk reaction of the political establishment at that time was to just suggest a wide-scale espionage of, of everyone to catch everyone who was illegally downloading stuff. And uh, technical people, I mean, the, the ideas were, were, for example, just ban encryption. And that, the, the consequences of that are just enormous. First of all, you can't do that. And, and if you try, that, that's going to be really, really, really silly for a lot of people. So the technical kind of industry, the human rights, civil rights and technical industry were like raising their hands and like trying to poke at, at these things. The Pirate Bay was then at, at, at the forefront of this. And we, the people downloading, illegally downloading uh, intellectual property and, and, and copyrighted stuff were named pirates. And the political movement that started as a, uh, as, as basically raising the the uh, raising attention on the espionage issue, uh, basically took on this nickname or or like bullying name or something like that uh, that the that the people were being called uh, owned it basically uh, turned it turned it tra turning it upside down and and say oh, sure this this is an issue there is a technical revolution going on. Uh, where we were dealing with like the first infinite resource you could you could think of where you, where you can copy just like make endless copies and in, in effect that's basically an endless resource and we don't have an account, economy to deal with an endless resource how we monetize that how how, how to how to price that and, and, and stuff like that we we've since then <laughs> done a very good job of it i think uh, although there might be a backlash in, in, in that. But anyway, the pirates come from that kind of background where there is a, like whole scale, whole, uh, wholesale uh, attempts to uh, spy on individual like citizens. And this has come to light with Snowden and Manning that, that that's what actually is happening. And uh, the pirates are saying like, we have to do things differently because human rights and civil rights, they do apply to the digital sphere. They, they just don't stop at, at, at your computer and all of a sudden you have no rights. And the uh, United, United Nations has actually uh, ha added to their uh, human rights uh, declaration that these rights also apply in the digital sphere since then. I think it was 2014. I, I, I forget exactly the, the, the date there. So uh, things are moving slowly in the right direction. Uh, but there's... there's <laughs> at at the heart, um, Bjorn, yeah. of, of the Pirate Party is really about participation and right, the, uh, one element of it. How has that changed and, and moved forward or developed or challenged the Icelandic democratic culture? 
Right. So, so the technological changes have enabled uh, greater participation, as you just see in, in like social media, how media is now social. Democracy can also be social. It's not a uh, many to one system. It's many to many system, just like the internet is. And that changes that, that gives us tools to use in democracy were tools that we didn't have before. I mean, if you go all the way back to like uh, Athens or Greece, you had these like rocks, you were, everyone was coming in and putting in their votes. But as, as, you, as you grow larger, have, have like a huge, a larger population, this becomes impossible just uh, physically until you have computers and uh, the inter interconnected uh, world we have, have today. So, uh, thinking about how we can transition from this one-to-many uh, kind of democracy to a many-to-many -many democracy is a challenge. And it's a challenge because the current system, it enables the current political establishment, establishments to maintain their power. They know how that system works uh, and they they, can't, they don't want to change any of that because that means giving up power. And this is all about power. Um, so we've, been, we've been poking at that. So yeah. that, that, that was the, the constitutional reforms that we were trying to push through. Uh, there was the crowdsourced uh, constitutional uh, process here that's since then been buried. But we have a draft ready that has all sorts of different uh, like updates modern updates to citizen participation in democracy and we're just trying our hardest to get it through but it's difficult to push through power yeah um so there is a lot there's a lot of opposition i suppose from the status quo people who are bought into the current system exactly um and so both of you have talked about really um different solutions democratic solutions to the same kind of technical revolution that has happened in society and it, and it really is a revolution how it's changed where power lies in society and everything how we work how we talk you know everything um and um what what i wonder is what do you think the response should be do we need evolution or a democratic revolution to match it what's the you know how ambitious can we be um in this moment in the uk but taking inspiration from international martial do you want to go first on that yeah um thank you uh, well we need to do both we need to do both uh, we need to be massively ambitious okay you know there's um i think you know it's, it's it's important to remember that some of the changes that have happened would have been considered preposterous before you know like um politicians being open about their sexuality or about women having the vote in, indeed you know th these are all uh, changes that were really really significant um, and um and were fought for so we've got to be completely uh, as ambitious as we as we possibly can be and accept that change happens in a gradual way um, and in a piecemeal way and and that we need many things to be happening at the same time so you know in the case of seat belts for example a very prosaic example where it's totally normal now for everybody to put seat belt on when we get in a car uh, that 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 happened through a combination of law peer pressure generational change and uh, enforcement uh, activity as well as statistics and facts that showed that people died more if they didn't have seat belts on so you know social change happens in complex ways and we need to uh, I tackle these questions in every single way that we possibly can through uh, lobbying existing uh, MPs, representatives, um, by uh, discussions like this, by social action, you know, and by uh, setting out uh, proposals for change that, that people can buy into, you know, and, and, and the change will happen, but, you know, it's not going to happen if we don't do things. Thank you. Um, Bjorn? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say exactly the same thing. I mean, this technological change that we've been going through for the past couple of decades is a revolution. I mean, society has gone through this revolution in an evolutionary kind of, of manner, but politics hasn't. Politics is resisting, and therefore they, 
they will suffer a revolt eventually if they won't evolve. That's inevitable. Uh, just how long they can resist? Will it, would it be a gener generational revolution? In which case, just there is all of a sudden a new generation that thinks in the in in, in the way that that uh, society has evolved, or um, or will the established parties actually update? Uh, I think sorry, to, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say also, just re reflecting on the fact that we've got people from different countries here, we also need to go with the grain of the traditions and the countries. You know, the UK will evolve in a particular way because of our history. Other countries have got written constitutions and, you know, they will evolve in different ways. So, you know, uh, that's one of the great strengths of democracy is that it actually reflects communities and the traditions of those communities. So, you know, we need to work in parallel uh, across different countries, but also uh, thinking about the ways that, that we work as a community and the different uh, pressures in, in, in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, in our case here, uh, but also globally as well. Yeah, you can have the same tools, but different outcomes. That's, that's easy enough. I mean, that, that's, that's what can happen, for example, in, in the UK or the US and, and Iceland. There's a different culture of, uh, like, there's a, there, there are different rules of democracy, the current ones. Uh, so, for example, if you, if you go to the US, they're very unlikely to get away with the uh, two-party system. It, it's close to being a two-party system in, in the UK as well, but yeah, first past the post and all, all of that. Uh, those are the kinds of rules that uh, dictate the, the frame of, of uh, where power lies. Uh, and you can add all of these new tools of democracy within that frame or you can change the frame and that that will have different outcomes based on on like uh the i i often say like politics is like a board game and uh, you always have the the people in power they always have the first move and uh, everyone in opposition just have uh, like a reactionary move they have really very limited set of, of moves that they can uh, use to react and uh these broad rules, the frame of how you distribute power, uh, for example, in, in the UK, I think you currently have like a majority of, of the, the Tories are in a majority, but, but with a minority of votes. Mm. That's like a, a, a frame uh, that, you'd that, that you might want to think about changing, uh, equal representation and all of that. Uh, so, so if you add that, if you I add guess. the same tools here as in, as in the in the UK, you'll have different outcomes based on 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 the filters. I, I, I sometimes call it a dilution of of democracy uh, from the re representational uh, to the like will of the people kind of of uh, system. Thank you so much for that. And just um, in a minute, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull some people in from the audience now who I know have relevant things to say on this and um, I would love Ellen to come in first and just talk about what, what Bjorn was talking about that fundamental change in distribution of power that digital brought. I'd also love to come to Jess Garland from the Electoral Reform Society to talk about the mechanis mechanisms of democracy and then Will Moy on that holding politicians to account on what they say. So, so Ellen do you want to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thanks so much to our, to our speakers for, for being here and really, really interesting discussion. I think a lot resonated um, with how we've been thinking about the challenges of, of the Internet age um, and particularly uh, what you were saying, Bjorn, about, about how the kind of the reaction to this very particular issue of, of copyright infringement was was to just think, OK, we've just got to shut things down. We've just got to close things off. Um, and I think that there's a, there's a risk of of that being the the approach as well to to when we're thinking about how the internet has changed democratic debate and political discourse and you know we we see a lot of you know very toxic discussions online we see a lot of very harmful discussions online we see women in public life facing kind of awful levels of of harassment and disinformation um, and I think there's there's a, a tendency sometimes to to think that the solution to that has got to be a, a sort of closing off and a, and a, and a, a, sh a sh shutting down of, of certain of certain things online and, and that that the online space is just this kind of mysterious place where we don't really understand how it works so we've just got to try and 
stop it doing bad things. Um, but I think what what it really highlights is this this kind of more fundamental point about who really does have the power to be shaping the environments in which we are having political conversation, the environments in which we're having kind of democratic discussions. And, you know, pre, pre-internet, it was not a, a kind of, you know, de- democratic uh, utopia by, by any means in terms of who controlled the, those sorts of spaces. And the, the, I think the, the internet has done a huge amount to, to democratize those spaces and to, to enable more people to be involved in, in those conversations. But fundamentally, the kind of the, the spaces which are most commonly used by those in politics are still very kind of you know, controlled by companies which have you know exist across the world and which which aren't don't really have any accountability to to any particular demos to to any particular citizens um and you know they they often will say yes we are here to to, to foster good discussions but then then the ways that they actually go about doing that are just kind of up to them um and that leaves i think users very kind of powerless in the, in, the, in that situation and citizens trying to use these technologies to to engage in in politics and political discussions in a new way um where there is kind of democratic innovation happening the sort of technological innovation you're talking about beyond how the question is really like how do we how do we scale that how do we make those kind of options available to everybody and and how do we how do we make that kind of compete with um you know just facebook deciding things for us um, so I'd be yeah, really keen to, to hear, hear from speakers and, and from other folks in the audience on how do we really kind of regain um, the sort of more democratic control over the spaces in which, in which these conversations are happening and not just sort of what's being discussed or how it's being discussed, but about the kind of the infrastructure that, that, that underpins where those discussions are happening. Ellen, thank you so much to that. Should we go to Jess next? Jess from the Electoral Reform Society. I'd love to hear what your, your thoughts were around kind of changing the mechanics of, of, democ- of the dem- democratic system here. Thanks, Polly. And thank you, Bjorn and Martial. It was so fascinating he- hearing your thoughts. And I was really struck by what you said there, Bjorn, about moving from the one to the many to the many to the many. And, and I feel like perhaps right now we're at a really interesting point on that journey. Perhaps it's only one stage on, on that evolution, but we are, I feel coming to an interesting point on this deliberative wave, if you like, this sort of, um, sort of decade almost of, of small pockets of democratic innovation, starting of course, well, not starting with, but certainly including the crowdsourced constitution in, in Iceland and, and, and lots of countries now are, around the globe sort of really embracing democratic innovation. and. Some opposition too, but I think a whole generation of policymakers who who have really embraced it, perhaps fully and, and perhaps not knowing entirely how it fits within existing representative structures. And I think we've got to the point now where that serious thinking about where we're at on that evolution, whether it's an endpoint, and we need to think how do our representative structures combine with this d- deliberative, not really innovation anymore, but trying to institutionalize uh, deliberative and other more mass forms of, of democratic in- innovation, how these things come together, not just in terms of best practice, like if your citizens tell you something and spend their time working out what it is, you know, you should probably do something about it, but, you know, really embedding it for the longer term. Um, And I just, I was struck by just a point about how fragile things are. Marcy, I mentioned there about how important rules are and some of our regulators, and we've seen recently, you know, um, our the Electoral Commission, which has been around for a long period of time, having its right strips away. And I think, you know, how do we, if we want to, to move towards that many to the many? How do we embed that for the longer term? And, and how do we do it both with the willing policymakers and those who perhaps are not familiar or feel threatened by it? I mean, we really feel that deliberative and representative democracy are two things that can support each other beautifully and, 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 and can help elected representatives, but, but that is a, a, a long journey. I think people have to experience it to, to really understand how that works. And we in this democracy sector need to really do the thinking as well to, to work out what, what perhaps the next stage in the evolution is um, and, and really moving more to more many, essentially in that, in that, um, in that ratio, more many to many um, than we're perhaps at, at this point in time. Thank you so much for that, Jess. That many to many idea is so kind of key to this, something I'm definitely kind of keeping in mind as we're we're speaking. I'm going to just like, because um, 
because I have the power of being chair, I'm going to very momentarily switch hats into kind of voice of Demos now and just talk a bit about kind of Demos's thought to Jess's point there. And my background as a journalist, I spent the last 10 years in journalism trying to open up journalism, trying to stop it being editors in a newsroom deciding what the truth is and then telling readers because I could see the digital environment becoming many to many and journalism had to listen to be better and had to and if and also needed to overcome its own limitations of being journalists in a newsroom in London far away from the communities it's writing about so to break down those structures and to open up journalism and listen and that's what's drawn me to Demos. Um, my predecessor, also another Polly, um, Polly McKenzie, um, wrote, has written a lot about the idea of humble policy making. And in the blended mo model that um, Jess is talking about, I think the question becomes kind of how do you convince those with power that they need to listen to make better policies? Um, because it's hard to share power. I've seen in kind of the world of journalism, it's really hard to give up what you think is a story um, when challenged by people telling you it's not a story. And it's the same in the world of policy making. I, I, I think kind of it's about saying we don't know what's right for everyone around the country, but if we go out and listen, we'll not only get a, a better policy at the end of it because it will reflect the reality of people's lives, you actually start to build some buy-in and build some kind of democratic ownership of it before you even launch. So that's that's a bit about kind of Demos's ideas around humble policy making. And a question I'd like to come back to after a couple of other other colleagues have spoken is, what is the change we need to achieve? Is it rules or culture? Because when I think about humble policy making, it's really kind of about attitudinal cultural things rather than rules um, and how do you get the balance of change between rules and culture right but um, um, I was so happy to see you here Will and um, Will Moy from um, Full Fact and when Martial mentioned um, um, holding politicians to account for things they say I thought I know a man who's doing that. Will do you want to introduce yourself and, and tell us what you're doing at Full Fact? Thank you, Polly. Um, what I'm doing at Full Fact is having a very long day and I uh, just came here to quietly lurk in the background. Uh, Full Fact campaigns for informed um, and improved public debate to raise standards of honesty and accuracy in public debate. And we're best known for our fact checking work. So every day we look at important claims coming in the media, coming from politicians, uh, circulating online. Uh, we fact check them. Millions of people rely on that analysis of whether they're true or not. When people get things wrong, we ask them to correct the record. When that doesn't work, we look at why misinformation has emerged into public debate and what can be done about it. Um, and that brings me to two questions I'd like to ask. Because one of the reasons that misinformation emerges in British political debate is that MPs can't and don't correct the record. Bizarrely, there is a rule in the House of Commons that allows ministers to formally correct the record when they get things wrong, but nobody else, no other member of parliament can formally correct the record when they get something wrong, even when they want, want to, which is just weird. Um, we have raised this with the House of Commons over several years. Uh, we raised it formally with the Speaker last year, he raised it with the Procedure Committee. Only this year did we manage to get the Procedure Committee to launch an inquiry into this topic. I'm giving evidence to that inquiry on Wednesday. And we are making a couple of main suggestions. One is extend the correction system because it's just odd to have a duty of honesty in public life but no way of fulfilling it. The second is have a mechanism where when ministers repeatedly get things wrong and refuse to correct the record, they can be forced to correct the record, because we have seen this Prime Minister 10 times in a row make the same demonstrably false claim, admit it's wrong, but refuse to correct it. And that is an extraordinary thing to put up with, but there's no mechanism to do anything about it. Which brings me to my two questions. One is, we are asking MPs to do what every member of the public would consider the blindingly obvious, and it's taken them a year to even engage with the question, let alone answer it. 
It will take them another six months to answer the question. And frankly, our best hope of getting a positive answer is if there's a new prime minister who wants to make a symbolic change. We're sort of riding political luck as much as any sort of the quality of the argument in getting that change. And it's a very, very minor change. So one question is, how do you deal in, in a world where Parliament has successively regulated every independent profession and in every other walk of life, as Martial was saying, has recognised that professions ought to be independently regulated. How do you deal with the people who regulate themselves or rather don't? Uh, how do you deal with that inherent conflict of interest? My second question is, we propose the change that we believe is proportionate and valuable, but we know is not what the public want. What the public wants is for it to be a criminal offence for MPs to lie to Parliament. Now, there are good reasons why that might not be an effective criminal offence, even if you created a law saying it. But still, the gap between public expectations of honesty and what politicians think is acceptable behaviour, having been dramatically illustrated today, will remain even if we get the, the changes we're campaigning for. And by the way, if you support those changes, go to fullfact.org, sign the petition. Um, but so first question is, how do we deal with the conflict of interest of the regulators regulating themselves? And the second question is, are we asking for enough or is it time to just recognize that things are too broken um, and that actually the public's instincts deserve to be followed rather than just incremental change, which while important is nowhere close to most people's democratic instincts? Um, really good questions. Um, and I think we should come back to Martial for the first. And then I'd like to bring in John Alexander on the second um, to talk about how big a change we need to address all these things. So, Martial, what do you think on that regulation point? Yeah, it, it's tricky. It's really tricky. But it, it, it is done now and it can be done. So, uh, so as you say, quite rightly, Will, most, um, in most, in virtually all cases, uh, MPs set the rules for everybody else. OK, With, whether they're bakers or butchers or candlestick makers, you know, they're setting the rules for everybody else. But they need to obey the rules as well. But how do they obey? The, how do they set the rules for themselves whilst they're playing the game of rule setting? It's like asking. Uh, footballers to agree the size of the goal that they're kicking the ball towards or defending you know it's a really tough thing to do but they've done it they have done it before usually under pressure of an expensive scandal or or some other scandal you know obviously that's not the the best way of doing these things but people as you say Polly they don't like uh, uh, giving up power um, it's happened for thousands of years but you know slowly like a ratchet we can gradually constrain people who are powerless, uh, uh, unaccountable, um, and uh, and impose a boundaries. But um, it it requires a, a, a delicate balance for these organisations, like the Electoral Commission and the Boundary Commission, ADIPSA and the National Audit Office, that all uh, hold politicians to account, but are accountable to politicians as well. And uh, the, the, the best way to think about it is to think about these bodies refereeing individual politicians, but being accountable to politicians collectively in the legislative chamber, you know? So it, it's a fine distinction, but we can do it. And select committees are a really strong way of doing that because they gather together people from different parties and they haven't got an executive focus and so uh, select committees are the best way, not perfect way, because they're all grandstanding as well, but they're the best way of, uh, of uh, channeling the accountability uh, that, that, that referees need to have towards a democratic process, um, but also give these organizations the freedom to be able to hold people to account. It's a really tricky job. And uh, anybody who sees the work of the Electoral Commission, who, as somebody uh, mentioned, are under pressure uh, because they've been holding politicians to account, ips are the same. The poor Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, goodness me, uh, there's uh, the current one and predecessors, they've had a really, really tough gig, but, uh, but their job's really, really important. So, you know, we do need to bolster that and, and there are ways of doing it. Mm. Absolutely. It's really, really interesting about how to solve the problem once it's happened. I'd like to come back to the question about how do we improve our political and democratic culture um, as well so that 
um, we don't get in this pickle again. Um, John, do you want to come in now and just answer that second point around kind of scale of change? John, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Okay, yeah. Hi, I, uh, John Alexander. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to copy Martial and go, I wrote a book. Uh, it's called Citizens, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is All of Us. Uh, it's slightly underambitious. Um, no, uh, look, I, uh, all of my work is really in maybe what i'll say so uh, firstly it's really good to be part of such a constructive uh an open conversation we're like trying to genuinely learn from each other and i want to try and contribute in that spirit i guess my my i'm sort of reflecting on the word hope in the title of this event as well i i, I love the definition of hope that rebecca solnit offers in her book hope in the dark she says um I, optimism is the belief that things will be all right no matter what we do. Pessimism is the belief that things will be shit no matter what we do. I'm paraphrasing slightly because she's much more poetic than me. But hope, hope is like hope exists in the space of uh, where we admit, and both optimism and pessimism excuse us from action. And hope, she says, exists in the spaciousness of uncertainty and like knowing that what we do matters, but we can't and, and we can't know what's going to happen unless we act. And and she says hope equals clarity plus imagination, which I think is a really helpful kind of combination to hold. Um, I guess what the reason why I go there is because I think um, the thing I there's one sort of negative thing, a sort of clarity point I sort of want to bring into the conversation, and one sort of imagination point as well. The cl the, the clarity point I guess is like I think this is becoming existential now. Actually, like I I don't think I I think so. There's something in what Bjorn and Marcel said at the beginning that makes it sort of almost like it's going to evolve. Like we'll get there at the end. Like it might be a clunk and uncomfortable, or it might be. But I'm a bit like like I see like fascism right like let's put that in the room because it's it's here uh and if and if it doesn't if we don't evolve it's not just that there might be a clunk when it does it's that the whole edifice is and so we're on we're on a time scale right like not just because of the climate emergency although that's there as well but like on a democratic time scale i think it's not just like it's not a nice to do now uh this stuff Has everyone else lost John? Yes, John, we can't hear you. And it was so good. Was I, have I gone, have I come back? Oh, there you are, you're back, keep going, Sorry. keep going. There's a, there's, a, there's a lovely moment. I don't know where you lost me, so I apologize if it was, uh, um, we were on a time scale. thanks Will. Helpful chatting. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, I'm glad you heard that bit. So, so the imagination point, maybe I'll pick up there, is basically like, I think, I mean, I. Th so, so I love the the way you phrased it earlier, Polly, was like evolution or revolution. And I guess I'm sort of, and we sort of said both, and I'd sort of go neither. Like I'm, I really love the the the, um, the Buckminster Fuller quote. He said, um, "You never fight, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, create a new model that makes the existing models obsolete." And I think there's a lot of that spirit in the pirate, the origin, the origins of the pirate party, and in crowdsourcing a constitution, and in, and I, and I, but I guess what I take for this moment in this country is like, these, I'm sorry, I'm really angry at the end of today. Like these fuckers aren't going to fix it, right? Like they're just not, uh, and there has to be. I think I think it's incumbent on organisations like Demos, like Tortoise, like like the the spaces that are that can hold. That, that potentially could hold a kind of conversation that could that could if not crowd I mean not crowdsource a constitution because that's there's so many complications to that but at least like hold the space engage Britain involve like all the electoral reform society like what would it be to actually hold a space where we went what would the fixes be what do we demand and not to try and compete with one another because that's part of the frame of what's dying right like the idea of a marketplace of ideas is it's got to be a it's got to be a holding space and i'm and and maybe and if we could do that if we could use some of the kind of the open source software that chasm have been so amazing at kind of charting in this country and we could we could use some of the deliberative polling and 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 citizens assembly type tactics because and do it do it in a way that sort of forces the attention into it but creates the quality of space i i, I actually i think it's difficult and i don't know exactly what i'm I don't have a sort of precise proposition that I'm and so I'm worried about being a bit sort of vague but I'm just going there has to be a 
I don't, I don't think we can ask them to do a process. I think we have to do a process out like slight, half in, half out and, and conduct the electricity into it and make it impossible to ignore. And, and, and I don't think, and, and, and in a, with sufficient quality that the sort of question Will's asking can be answered because these changes have to have public legitimacy and they have to have public involvement to get that legitimacy. Thank you so yeah. much for that, John. Bjorn, did you have your hand up? Did you want to come back on that? Go, go for it. Yeah, just a, a tiny bit. Um, so people often don't know what the like job of a, of a parliamentarian is. It, it's kind of strange, really. Uh, essentially, it, it boils down to, to taking a, a, a making a decision based on conscience, really, because members of parliament they can't be. Uh, it's impossible for them to be experts at everything, especially in in now a bigger and more co complex world. So essentially, after you've compiled the uh, solutions to a, a particular issue down to a few different options, it's the politicians, uh, the member of parliament's uh, job to basically say, yeah, this, this looks to be the best way to move forward with, for society. It, they're basically taking a, an, an, an opinion on conscience, not based on professionalism. The professionalism has already been packed into these are the pros and cons of, of, of everything. So here, is is my like um, approach to uh, like before this decision comes to politicians as a computer scientist like as, as a software de developer we've uh, in in the software industry we've we've made a process like iterative process the, the sprint process and all, all of that to connect uh, industries that don't know how to talk to each other they don't speak the same language so you can't have someone who, who, who has a problem. This is, this is, you, you can mirror this to the democracy. Uh, you can't have a, a group of people that have a problem uh, just tell the programmers, or in this case, legislation, uh, this is our problem, solve it uh, like this. And the legislature can't just create the solution out of thin air because they're not talking the same language. They're, they don't have the same understanding of uh, what the problem is, how the solution works, legally speaking. So it has to be an iterative like, process where you go back and forth and back and forth all of the time. And uh, this is, I think, what's missing. It's not just to throw things in, in a deliberative like uh, process uh, program that would even that'll get like, uh, here's a proposal, here's comments, and here, here we have a vote. It's, it's a lot bigger than that. And I think uh, we have to view democracy more as a, an iterative process where we have a, a goal. I often call like utopia as a moving target. We have this utopic goal somewhere off in the distance and, and say as a society, this is where we wanna go. But along the way, as we like talk about it, as we make decisions towards that goal, we might see new goals that, oh, wait a minute, we hadn't foreseen this and we want to change directions. This, this is like the uh, Scottish independence vote, for example. It was, it was a really narrow. The results of that isn't now it's just, it's out. Of course not. It, because it's narrow, it, it, it's telling us that we need a bigger conversation. We need a process to continue to get a, uh, um, a result, a result isn't like a 51-49 uh, democratic election vote. We can't just ignore 49% of the people. Uh, Brexit should have been something like that too, unfortunately. Uh, so yes, I, I, I think we need to do more and more of like the, 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 the big discourse, I guess you could say. Sorry, Thank you thanks. so much for that. In the, in the last 10 minutes, I want to pick on, up on that and, and talk more about what participatory um, uh, democracy could look like, the deliberative democracy, how we could scale that. And then in the last thing I want to cover is just come back to this political moment now and to open it up to everyone and bring in any other voices. I want to know what people think 
this political moment means for the potential for change. Like everything that's happened on a really dramatic day in Westminster, what do we think the consequences will be in five years time of today? So just, just a tiny question there. Um, but the question on participation, it picks up on what John said about kind of designing a parallel system. Um, it picks up on what Jess said about the fact that there's been so much deliberative democracy out there um, already. And I wanted to come to Martha McKenzie, if it's okay, from um, Civic Power, who knows about how actually we're doing a lot of this deliberative engagement democracy at a local level. Martha, is, is this something, sorry to bring this on you, as I have done everyone else, but with, have you got something to say around that? No, not, not at all. Thank you, Polly, and, and thanks to all the brilliant speakers. This has been such a riveting and important discussion. I think just by way of introduction, so I uh, run the Civic Power Fund, and we are a new intermediary funder that's focused really specifically on community organising and getting money into the hands of grassroots organizers and campaigners doing local engagement with democracy and kind of core issues in their community. I think one thing I just wanted to touch on actually is this many to many, because this is something we feel really strongly about as well. And one of the reasons we're an intermediary funder is that we try and kind of correct the power imbalance in philanthropy by being many to many as well. So raising resources from lots of different sources and then getting them into the hands of many different groups. So I think this idea of many to many is just gathering steam in so many places. I think just touching like very briefly on the, the local aspect and the sense of how we can build power, I think we would really agree with what Bjorn said, it is, it is all about power and right now communities are feeling increasingly powerless and this is leading to this like very dangerous, as John said, disenfranchisement and democratic decay. And something like organizing where local communities can come together, engage directly with their politicians and their elected officials to see change has a really big potential to shift that. First, because it kind of creates a hope and agency because things actually start to get done and you start to do them in tandem with your fellow citizens. But second, because it starts to build up that accountability where politicians can't just go off to Westminster and do whatever they want. There is a sense that there is actually a kind of groundswell of people in their constituency and across the country who will hold them to account and who will engage with democracy. And this feels like such a kind of vital missing piece of the puzzle that we're struggling with at the moment. And it's one of the reasons why we exist. But I think the other one thing I just wanted to pick up on was the point we heard about agitation. And actually every time there's been kind of progressive movements or progress in politics, there's always been a kind of agitated element as well. And so how do we marry this idea to come back to the rules versus revolution or reform revolution idea of what does it look like to really engage in a kind of deliberative, positive, hopeful and imaginative way at the local level? but also recognize if we want to achieve big picture systems change, there might be just some discomfort, there might be some agitation, and how can we bring those two things together so that they're not destructive, but they're actually hopeful and transformative. And um, so that's a kind of a big question for the very small amount of time we have left, but yeah, just echoing the, the thanks. This has been a really thoughtful discussion. Martha, thank you so much for that. So, um, um, so evolution, revolution, or, or, agitation kind of the the various methods to change um we clearly have this big political moment right now as we speak really who else is i don't know what will have happened in the past hour um does anyone want to come in on that point what's the potential of this moment we were talking about in the office earlier we're doing a, an event around hope is it really hopeful or you know is this a moment where we might see change can i come back to you on on that briefly martha and then anyone else who's got something to say on that can you put up your little yellow hand business martha what do you think do you think this is a moment that could accelerate change or snarl it up i think i sort of come somewhere in the middle which i know is a a, a bit of a cop-out answer that we've been talking a lot over the last week about the urgency of of really investing in community organizing and building community power to kind of correct this democratic decay, but also the fact that this work really takes time and we've got a lot of corrective work to do and a lot of kind of rebuilding to do. So I think for me, this could be a moment where collectively we recognize that if we don't get money into the hands of the grassroots, really start building community, really kind of responding to John's challenge there about kind of, we are in a dangerous time, we are on a time scale. This could be a moment in which we collectively realize that and we see that something has to shift in terms of the relationship between the public and our politicians but equally it's just been such a frenzied time and there's been so much kind of 
delay in this front that the risk of it continuing without that action I think is quite high so I'm hopeful but not maybe overly optimistic mm. well hopeful is better than not hopeful <laughs> um Jess do you have anything to say on that just on that kind of what what what's your reading are you replanning your whole kind of approach to how you're going to achieve, achieve all your aims because of the political moment we're in I'm always wary of the hot take because it's necessarily always a little bit uninformed. I mean, certainly I don't think there's any reason to be ripping everything up until we see where, where things lie. I've been fascinated to see how all the discussion is turned right back round to integrity. And, 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 and that's just one step away from where we want to be, which is like what's good quality democracy and a democracy that people feel proud of and, and feel that they want to, to be part of. And I think it's probably a long journey to get there um and i say we're certainly not changing the plans uh, i'll go back to what i was saying earlier about this moment we are at with innovation and democracy and i think where i come from is that ultimately that that's all brilliant but but your, your fundamental representative democracy the quality of that and the structures it's what bjorn was saying earlier about the framework is so important and i think you can end up going around in a circle of declining trust and this you absolutely kind of nail that and I think it's got to be a little bit of everything. It has to be the evolution. It's got to be the revolution. It's got to be the agitation and the activism as well. Um, I differ slightly from John in the sense that I don't think it can just be on the outside. I think we've got to be helping those with power to, to come to realise that they need to change as well. So I think there's the, the, there's lots of us doing this. We need to be tacking it from all the different angles. And um, change is always an opportunity for reform, isn't it? So I'm, I remain hopeful on that front. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Bjorn? Yeah, um, I hope this is a, a catalyst of, of, of breaking the, the constant uh, flow of doubling down of sorts. Uh, we've, we've been catching politicians at lies and they double down on the lie. And this is continued throughout yeah, with in, in the US with Trump and, and uh, with a lot of things that Boris Johnson has, has, has been going through as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the people that have something to say about it are doing something about it now. And I hope at least that it'll have the effect moving on that people that can do something about politicians lying will do so sooner. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I hope will happen. Mm. Um, and just lastly, before I kind of um, round things off, Marcia, what do you hope will happen? Uh, well, um, uh, I am optimistic and I am hopeful, both, you know, uh, but, it's, but um, you know, as, uh, as, as previous people have said, uh, there are bumps along the road and some of those bumps could be really awful. You know, I mean, let's make no bones about it. You know, fascism, fascism was mentioned. I mean, I, I'm not expecting that to happen in countries with really deep de democratic roots. But, uh, but, but as a world, we're going through a anti-democratic mo moment, and uh, you know, we've got to get through this intact. But the way that we will, the way that we will change and improve is by coming up with solutions so that, so that the current generation of politicians who want to take up the offer of improved democracy and the next generation will have um, proposals that are, are feasible um, and, uh, and that people in this room and elsewhere are all working in our separate and collective ways to make improvements happen, you know, in the ways that a uh, full fact is uh, that the electoral reform um, um, movement is as well and, and in different countries. So, you know, we've all got to do this uh, and, uh, and keep on pushing in this direction because it must happen and it won't happen unless we keep on uh, acting and talking. Mm. Well, listen, thank you all so much for taking part in this conversation. This is first in a series we're going to run over the course of the next year. And I feel like what we've achieved in this conversation is the framework for that conversation. So all the elements from this conversation, I would like to break down and drill down into those areas. We went from international democracy to local civic power. We went from the problems to the solutions to the way of making change. There's so much kind of collective energy around this conversation at the moment. And um, it feels like there is something positive and hopeful we could do together on this. So 
um, um, I will follow up with an email just capturing some of the highlights of this conversation and thinking about next steps. How can we take this conversation together forward? Because um, it's only with a, a, a wide diversity of voices that we're going to, um, we're going to get anywhere on this. So just say thank you very much again to Bjorn and Martial and to everyone who joined and contributed and listened um, and have a lovely evening. Let's go and see what's happened in the news. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Polly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.